All right then, everybody. So if you missed my earlier introduction, uh, my name is Joseph Russell, and I'm Strategy Director at JH. I've been there for coming up to 12 years, uh, working my way up from doing design and front end through to kind of leading discoveries and research for our clients. And as well as hosting the track today, I also get to bring you the next session. Now, at last year's conference, I had a panel that was all about facing down inflation. You know, things weren't looking good then. And, you know, we discussed building a resilient strategy and trying to predict those challenges that were going to lay ahead over the next 12 months. Now, today in the present, we can actually reflect on what happened. And, well, there was some good news. You know, customers found a little bit of money so they can have a splurge at Christmas. And, you know, inflation has fallen from, uh, I don't know, about 9.6, 9.7 to 3% right now. Um, so, you know, there's some who would like you to believe that a corner has been turned. Um, but, you know, really, our economy did enter a technical recession in Q1. And stats just from the last couple of weeks from the ONS reported, you know, 0% growth for April. So we had a technical recession, zero growth the month after. Not looking good so far. And the reality is that costs and prices are still high. Consumers have really, you know, exhausted their funds. And it's starting to pinch on everybody. Um, again, this month, a report from Retail Economics looking at the 34.4 billion cost of abandoned baskets in the UK um, really shone a light on um, these kind of three cohorts, younger buyers, middle-aged buyers, higher income buyers, you know, people who a lot of us are dependent on uh, for, for trade and that they were an increasing amount of those abandonments, okay? So they are feeling that pinch, feeling that squeeze. And, you know, it's against that backdrop we've seen brands big and small going under. But, you know, not everyone has had the same experience. Some people have really been thriving. And, you know, if you're in the right vertical, you know, things like health, like beauty, you know, a bit of gardens, some homeware, you've done all right. But um, as you can see up here, there's some others who haven't. It has been really tough. And they've seen like 10, 20% drop in their year over years. However, as well as being the right vertical, I think a lot really rests on making the right choices. Uh, and, you know, we've got multiple clients who've charted such a chuck course, and they've been able to maintain double-digit growth year over year for the past two or three years. You know, despite those difficulties, despite seeing traffic drops and conversion dips that I think probably a lot of you will be familiar with from your analytics. And because I get to work closely with them on their strategy, I've had that kind of inside perspective and I've been reflecting on kind of what sets them apart. You know, what is it that they're doing? You know, yes, they're making smart choices, but is there something about the way they're making those choices too? And I'm summing it up as strategic focus. Um, or to paraphrase the brilliant modernist designer, uh, Mies van der Rohe, doing less to do more. So rather than incurring the costs of you know, short-sighted plans and real kind of hurried speed, building up more debt, making the wrong decisions, they've got you know, real clear, confident direction about where they want to go, and therefore they can move with velocity instead. And what better way for you guys to learn more about that than for me to bring one of those clients out? Um, that client that I'm bringing today is Big Bus Tours. They're the largest operator in the world of open-top sightseeing buses. They serve 26 city, cities in 15 countries and operate over 150 buses. Um, joining me on stage today is going to be the head of e-commerce and digital experience. He's got a significant track record in customer experience that goes back 20 years with roles at places like EDF and Barclay Card before joining Big Bus. Um, so please give a huge, huge welcome to, uh, to Hugo. We'll sit this way, that way it's not so adversarial. Uh, I'm not trying to catch you out today, Hugo, at all. Um, now, I gave a little bit of background there for people about Big Bus, but you know, can you give everybody a little bit more of an idea of what, what it is you offer and how you, is that you operate? Yeah, so Big Bus Tours um, is ostensibly an open-top sightseeing bus tour company, um, operating, as you said, in 26 cities currently and growing um, uh, central services as as head office is called, is based in London, mainly based in London. Um, and yeah, the sort of working model is we have a support, support centrally here, but we're dealing with sort of uh, 20, uh, a huge disparate spread 
of cities, customer types, geolocations, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. And you know, obviously, the, the hop-on, hop-off bus is like the core concept. But I know this year, there's a new company, Mission. And that's really the thing that's kind of reshaping the, the strategy. Can you give us a bit of an idea of, of, of that new mission and, and what it means? Yeah, so, so our sort of overarching brand mission is inspire the spirit of adventure um, and to be the number one thing to do in every world famous city. I think that's important because it's not, we're beginning to diverge away from the concept of just being a bus tour company. Um, we want to be the tour to do in every city and, and, and recent acquisitions and, and development of our tickets and propositions have been more focused on experiences. So not just sitting on an open top bus, but maybe going out and sort of doing some dune bashing in Dubai or doing some wine tours in San Francisco, Napa Valley. Um, so that whole concept of we're not just about the bus, we want to be the number one thing that you do when you turn up into a world, yeah. world famous. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of people here who are selling products, they're not selling travel. And so I think there's re some really unique things. Um, you described the products there, but I think about the customer intent and the customer behavior too, you know, things that you see in your analytics um, that other people might not you yeah. know, normally get to experience. Yeah. I mean, first thing, I, I will say this is the most data-led organization I've ever worked for. Um, I spend a lot of my time in Google Analytics, Hotjar. I've got a wonderful tech team who keep telling me things. Um, and what we do know is, is we, we only have our customers for a very short window. It's about 80% of purchases are done on the day on a mobile. So literally walking from the hotel room to the bus mm -hmm. stop. Um, it's an immediate thing, and that in itself presents a really interesting challenge around digital experience and how yeah. we actually capture that customer. Yeah, and I believe it's still like 25% happening like on the streets as well. Like you've got staff on the street serving, you know, getting people onto the onto the buses as well. Um, but that whole on the day, you know, in the city experience, the mobile that informs a lot of it, you know. And I think we've got a couple of bits that we're going to go over where. I think you'll see that emphasis on mobile, that emphasis on um, speed to conversion has been, has been a big driver um, for us. Um, what about technical setup? Because, you know, again, the architecture is quite um, a simple one, really. To say that it's, it's a, a, a global operation, it's actually quite a simple architecture, and there isn't the usual kind of array of third parties getting plugged in. Um, can you give us a bit of a, a flavor of what Big Bus are using there? Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it is fairly simple. I mean, tech, tech might tell me it's not. But essentially, the web is on, is on Magento, um, which, which, although is a, a hardcore retailing engine, actually suits us really well from a, from a store pers perspective, because we're in 26 countries, uh, cities, sorry. Each has their own website, multiple languages. We have like 60-odd mm. stores. So that setup is great. Plugged into Ventrata, which is our ticketing um, and booking system, um, very slick, works really well. Yeah. The app is on a completely different platform, um, bespoke CMS, um, but then that also feeds into Ventrata as well. So we kind of, it's a kind of three-head three -head yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, it's straightforward. Yeah, th there's a lot of interconnection there between them all, and um, you mentioned Ventrata for tickets. For, for everybody else's benefit, like ordinarily you'd have an ERP or a PIM or something like that, but at Big Bus, it is just Ventrata, and that is doing tickets for, for, for everything, web, app, on the street, affiliates, yep. the, ho the whole kit and caboodle. So yeah. it's, a, it's a slightly different kind of back end in terms of where you push your, 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 your product setup from. Yeah, um, exactly. Um, I think another thing, though, I, I said there's not many third parties, but actually a big one for you guys is TripAdvisor. You know, it's not Trustpilot, it's not Reviews, I like you know, TripAdvisor, because of course you do travel, right? Yeah. Um, so that's always something we try to bring through for people, isn't it? Yeah, and, and actually what um, our customer services team is fantastic in that they bring all of those review platforms into uh, reputation.com. So we amalgamate Google feedback, TripAdvisor, anything else basically, all plugs into an overall score, um, which is fantastic both obviously for the operations but also to drive us forward in what, in what we're planning. Yeah, yeah. Now I think the first thing I want to talk about you know, with regards you know, strategic focus is how we create the annual roadmap. I think a lot of it really kind of starts there. It feels like the cornerstone for me that then everything else branches out from. Um, 
you know, we've been able to work on that with you guys for about four years now, so we've had the chance to uh, not just do multiple roadmaps, but actually kind of get a bit meta and talk about the way that we improve that process um, as well. Um, I just thought maybe a place to get started here, though, is to kind of rewind back to that company mission before. Um, you know, how has that been translating into more tangible strategies? You know, what kind of, what are you, how are you starting to break that down and what things are you kind of looking at as a business? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I, um, I'll be honest, I joined the company at the absolute perfect time because it was post-COVID. Um, there'd been a lot of build-up of, um, you know, I mean, obviously everyone got hit really hard, especially travel and leisure, um, but a lot of build-up of ideas, foundational ideas um, around getting us in fit for purpose to be able to kick on and do some really cool stuff. So as soon as I joined was, you know, implement new payment service provider, um, onboard new CMS, um, sort out um, express payments, sort out sort of foundational capabilities um, that then has allowed us in the last previous year and then looking forward to now really focus on pure e-com, actually pure um, how do we squeeze the most value out of our products? How do we merchandise better? How do we sell the value? How do we target? How do we personalize? Um, so that's how the plans kind of evolved from those really big building blocks. And that's the web. The app is a few years behind. So the app, we're now thinking of those big building blocks for the app. And so that's kind of following. Um, but it's all really cool. It sets us up to do, do some really cool things in e -com. Yeah, yeah. And each year, there's been... Um like an overarching theme. You mentioned there, you know, in the time before you joined, it was a lot of um, overdue stuff and foundational stuff. And then since then, we've been able to do two more years, you know, while you've been, while you've been working with us, Hugo. Um, and I know that, you know, the past year, that's, as you've mentioned already, been all about merchandising, all about going, okay, we've got a solid foundation. Now let's, you know, let's start turning some dials. Um, how have you found having an overarching theme works to help focus the team on the efforts for the year ahead. Yeah, it, it really does, because, because there's, the, there's no noise. I mean, the good thing about working for a smaller, a smaller business, I mean, we're a big business, but the central services and central support is small, is, you know, you've got tech over there, you've got marketing here, you know, you've got all the teams are next to each other. Um, and so we can focus on what actually needs doing. We can also sequence things really well. And again, shout out to the tech team, because they are incredibly good at focusing me, because um, I literally go all over the place. Um, but to bring that sort of, no, this needs to happen before that, really, really helps in decision making. It actually really helps tell the story um, all, all the way up, um, all the way up you know, to the CEO, um, CEO yeah. and CFO as well. Yeah. And why did we look at merchandising this year? I mean, obviously, we're in the right place to do it. But like, what was it you were hoping to get from looking at merchandising in particular? Yeah, so the um, then CEO, Phil Boggan, um, uh, basically set the agenda for our year just gone um, around value. So we have three pillars. I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty standard pillars, but, you know, grow customer volume, increase the value for each customer, and then there's a sort of OPEX and, and sort of hygiene one, which is uh, maximize um, margin through efficiencies. We had a real focus on value and we still have. So whereas we're quite, and you sort of touched on it, we, we are quite a traditional business coming to terms with not being so traditional. So whereas previously we'd do 30 or 40% of sales on the street, now digital is actually just creeping ahead um, um, to that 25% mark. But, and, and, and in that traditional style where the key metric was bums on seats, how many passengers have we got? You know, clicker, clicker, clicker. Oh, look, we've got 100 passengers. It was almost like, well, fine, but if they're only spending five quid each, then that's, that's kind of not worth it, right? So the focus being on how do we present the best proposition to the customer at the best margin for us so that, so that it's a win-win. And so then even if we do sacrifice, and it's been hard for me because we've been sacrificing conversion rate a little, but because we've been going after mm. the value. Yeah. We've, been increasing, we've been increasing the average order value per transaction. Um, it was up by about 10% last year, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so we're getting a lot more bang for, for our buck, really. Yeah. And I think you mentioned that, you know, some of the, the KPIs um, that you're looking at and um, thinking about the way that we actually like, organize the roadmap. Um, 
you know, obviously we kind of have a 12-month view, but I think what's been really good there is um, it's a simple set of KPIs and then a simple set of, of work streams. We've only really got about four or five of them, um, you know, looking at revenue, experience, scaling operations, so kind of mapping a little bit to those um, KPIs. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also been pretty key that we've also got a bit over on the side for stuff we're not going to do. Um, we've two bits there. One's called not planned, and one's called FY25. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, and for me, it's not a strategy unless you're leaving something out. Um, how's that helped in, in, internally with expectation management? Yeah, it's really good. And, and, and you know, like with all plans, you know, you've got your Q1, 2, 3, 4. So Q1 and 2 have about 95% of stuff in it, and then 3 and 4 get sparser and sparser as you kind of get more uncertain. Whereas in previous roles, we're just kind of smash on anyway, here we're not, we're not afraid to say, do you know what, let's just park that one, put it in the parking mm. lot. We've got plenty of leeway in Q3 and Q4. And actually what's interesting as well, with the big project work, so not, not BAU change, because we're doing BAU change all the time, and I think we'll get onto that anyway, but on the bigger ticket items, actually they're, they're all about the coming year. So whatever we deliver in the current year, the benefit gets realized in the following year. So actually, once you accept that, you kind of go, well, fine, it can wait till Christmas. Because as long as it's ready for Easter, you know, when everything kicks off again, that's kind of OK. So that really, really helps actually mm. spread the load. But it also helps the product owners be able to manage, manage the budget, keep a little bit aside, have yeah. stuff for a rainy day. It sort of helps us keep that flow yeah. going. So. I think like another way that there's some separation there is we kind of take the BAU and the maintenance stuff and kind of put it aside. Um, so whether that's in terms of like budget, the management of it, um, you know, the, the kind of backlog mm -hmm. there is, is completely separate, which, which helps us maintain focus on like the bigger kind of, um, you know, the bigger kind of transformational uh, pieces there. Yeah. Um, you know, I think another thing, just to kind of wrap up this section that I think has been really key, as well as how we actually put it together, is how we reflect on it. I think we've done a lot in terms of kind of not just like annual get-togethers where we kind of like plot it out, but those kind of quarterly reviews um, because it really sets a tone for collaboration because you bring a whole, um, you know, multi-faceted BB team together, BBT team together, mm -hmm. and then we bring, again, multiple roles from JH to that conversation as well. Um, how do you find that in terms of like making a difference to not just setting the roadmap, but then being able to achieve it. Yeah, it, it is really good. Because also, you know, I'm juggling sort of two roles. One is the sort of keeping the lights on, business as usual, dealing with cities on a day-to-day -day basis about their week-to-week -week performance, as well as then delivering big stuff. Um, and so it is really good to get together with you, at, you know, regular times, um, get taken out for a nice lunch, and, you know, chat through what worked, what didn't work, and, um, uh, you know, reset the plan. We've done that before. Yeah. You know, even review what we're going to do and reset the plan for later. So Yeah. So we can always keep it in focus with those refreshers, basically. The, yeah. The picture, I think, over time starts to blur, and then we need those resets to kind of get everybody back on the, back on the same page, to use a, a cliche. Um, I think the second point here on focus for me is that even though we kind of set up that roadmap and it feels like there's a lot of real great experience in the room making those decisions, that we complement that intuition with a lot of data and insights as well. And, um, you know, we've been leveraging that whether we're making marginal gains uh, through the kind of CRO work or, you know, the big, big step stuff there. Um, you know, you mentioned already, you know, we had to get those obvious changes out of the way. But um, I think with those out of the way, you and I were both, you know, big advocates for then switching into a kind of test, learn, iterate mm -hmm. thing. And a lot of the roadmap has that kind of built, um, uh, built into that. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about why for you um, that iterative data-led approach is so important? Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, really pleased with the CRO program. Um, we implemented it uh, in Anger last year. Um, and now, you know, it didn't take long before we just got just doing conversion rate optimization, just as that's just what we do. Eight to 10 tests are running pretty much concurrently every month. And we've got a backlog with, I don't know, X hundred things in it. Um, 
it's not just testing buttons, but I think we'll get to that in a minute. Um, um, but uh, it's worked really, really well, the speed with which we managed to do it and to inform. And on the data-led stuff, I'll say it again, this is the most data-led company I've ever worked in, and actually it's the most useful <laughs> because we've got 26 general managers in all the cities, you know, crying and shouting and screaming as to why this isn't working. Why, I mean, they're all lovely, by the way, actually. I'm being, I'm being mean about them. But, you know, they run their, their operation is king. They run that like, you know, it, it's a micro business for them. Hmm. Um, and having those data points to be able to prove and show and demonstrate uh, and even review, find out new things, um, is just, it, it's just invaluable. Yeah. Just to be able to, you know, tell the story and actually, most important, gain buy-in from them. You know, so that we get to a point where Definitely. we're just trusted to do yeah. stuff, which, is, yeah. which has been a fantastic step forward, really. Yeah, you mentioned there about like, being the most kind of data-led. I mean, you've mentioned already the CRO stuff, where obviously we're doing experiments. You mentioned Hotjar, Hotjar. in there. I know like, within the business as well, there's always post-implementation reviews, PIRs happening. So whenever we do a big project, internally at Big Bus, somebody's job is to put a report together to say, here's what we did the impact. So there's, there is a constant conversation within the culture of the business yeah. about looking at the ROI and actually, and also being open to where things don't work. I think that's, you say about the buy-in from, um, you know, from the, the steering group, from, you know, the, the higher-ups in the business. That actually, um, it's not just that we that we've um, been able to kind of build trust to make these changes mm -hmm. and build trust for us to do experiments, but actually that they've bought into failure as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, so we, yes. Yeah, so the, the overall governance is our tech steering group, which has the chairman, the CEO, and the CFO on it, amongst others. Um, they approve any project spend, even if the spend is in the budget. Again, going back to the, just because it's in the budget doesn't mean we're going to do it. It just means there is money there. We still need to go and justify it and present the ROI, um, and then it's normally me, has to then go back several months later with a, with a post-implementation review and um, see whether my business case thing was actually true mm -hmm. or not. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Phil, the CEO then, um, um, he's now Chief Commercial Officer, was actually most happy when I came back and showed we completely failed on something. <laughs> um, and I know that sounds quite cheesy, but actually he really appreciated it because there was no point there was no point glossing it, and, and he actually leads from the front, which is, yeah. you know, learn fast, fail if you have to, but just keep going. And, and, and just say very quickly, and you know, I said to you when we were talking before, you know, again, this is the most agile company I've ever worked for, and it's not just because we're small, but just, just the way we do things. Now, it's not pure agile, but from a, you know, we have a very rigid sprint, sprint set up, we have regular stand-ups, you know, all the work streams are always on point all week, um, you know, our POs hold us, hold us to account all day long, um, and it just works really, really well. Yeah, yeah. I think, just before we move on to the next bit, I think it's worth spending a moment talking about the experimentation we've done, um, because, you know, a lot of people will dip their toe in and will go, let's change a button color, let's change the call to action. But, I mean, we've done some of that. Yeah, we have done We've used colors, a yeah. bit of MVT for that. But we've been doing, again, because the the theme for the year is merchandising, it's been a lot more complex than that. It has been, you know, the way that we frame products, the way we talk about discounts and offers, the way that you organize them. Um, I feel like we've learned a lot more from doing that more radical kind of test than doing the, like, nudge, tweaking around the edges. Yeah, uh, so much more. Yeah, so much more. And, uh, and you know, it, each city is different, you know, different from their product makeup, different from their user type, obviously different from the sorts of tours and experiences that sell well, but also at different times of the year, different times of day. <laughs> different times of day, yeah. Yeah, so we've been doing a lot of sort of product placement, we've been doing a lot of merchandising, doing a lot of, you know, let's try this, let's try, you know, let's try talking about the value of a ticket, let's, you know, let's try talking about whatever, um, to really hone in where I want to get to with it, and we haven't actually talked about this in, in depth, but I know you, is um, to have truly dynamic merchandising where rather than building tests going, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if we put a Vatican tour at number one for Rome rather than number three and maybe knock, a, knock five quid off it and see what happens, but actually have an engine, and maybe there's one out there, I don't know, someone might be able to tell me, 
but, but that, that is able to dynamically present the best ticket at any given time. And best, obviously, to be determined is that value, is that whatever. But, but that's where we want to get to. And, and be, because things fluctuate, you know, you're not going to buy a three-day ticket on a Tuesday when it's not a school holidays. You know, Friday, you're probably more likely to buy a three-day ticket. You're not going to buy, you know, a one-day ticket at two in the afternoon. So there's kind of all that sort of flex to be able to have that dynamic mm. and intelligent and intuitive without us manually building tests would be amazing. But what we've done through the CRO program has informed that. And yeah. had, had we not been doing those things, we wouldn't have even had that spark of what's next. Yeah. I mean, we've also optimized the program itself. I know you mentioned in there about, uh, obviously, you know, because a lot of people are buying tickets in the city, they're buying it during the daytime. Uh, there are night, tour, night oh, tours. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, obviously, great. we see peaks in the daytime. And, um, we, you know, we've been iterating the process, how we do retrospectives, how we plan it. Um, again, it's like the roadmap. It's another place where it's super collaborative. Yeah. Um, but a big change we had to make was to the CRO tool. That might be a question you guys have for one of us later. Um, just to say, we were on VWO. We're now on convert.com. It's because VWO wasn't splitting the traffic throughout the day. It was sending you know, half the traffic one place in the morning and half in the afternoon. And obviously, with what is essentially seasonality within 24 hours, um, that wasn't working for us. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that's been really great with the tool is that we've actually been able to not just test the marginal gain stuff, you know, that Team Sky, um, you know, Dave Brailsford kind of find every little thing you can tune. Mm -hmm. But um, it's actually been a great tool for us testing the bigger things we've launched. Mm -hmm. So when we've done really big redesigns recently, we've been able to put that out, um, and instead of just launching it willy-nilly, we've been able to put it against the existing design and see, OK, well, that new listing page is two or 300% better at getting a conversion mm. than the one we had before. Yes. So split using, by device, getting that, split yeah. By, you know, split by yeah. customer type. Um, the only thing I would say about that, it's been fantastic having that level of insight. It has caused me more challenges to then be able to make um, the argument as to why something should go live. But it's for all the right reasons, yeah. right? So. so um, um, no, it's been revelationary, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, again, data's kind of attached to the launch button. Yeah, isn't 100%. Um, the third thing I want to kind of get onto here, just, you know, is, is that we're not just kind of optimizing the customer experience and not just optimizing the CRO, but um, there's a constant drive to unlock more value from, from the platforms. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I said, the, the, the tech structure is very simple, so there's not a lot of places we can go for that. Um, but that really feels like a place where we've been able to, um, you know, to focus our efforts um, and and kind of acknowledge that um, the alternative, which is to chase shiny things, to switch over, ha comes with a lot of um, a lot of costs. I think um, there's been a couple of talks already today that have kind of mentioned that uh, that kind of fallacy of of chasing after a, a change rather than making more of what you got. Um, now, from my perspective, you know, the key thing there's been Ventrata and what we can do with the APIs. Like it, the, we've been very API-led, very kind of all about building kind of headless experiences there because of, obviously we have the architecture where everything is connected, right? Um, you know, I think a big thing there has been the booking management system. Yeah. Um, do you want to give everyone a little bit of an idea of, of what that is and why we needed it? Yeah. Uh, and there's two things actually, but yeah, but, uh, booking management has been fantastic. So that is then pulling in. You know, the challenge we've got is that we don't have, we don't have a customer, we just have a booking. Um, I'm working on, and with Alicia who's there in the front row as well, we're working on the, um, uh, building out a CRM program where we start to try and get the concept of a customer, but we don't have a named customer generally. So we have a booking. So using that booking that sits in Ventrata to be able to then pull through all of the tickets that sit under that booking, some of them need action, some of them don't, but to be able to pull that through sets us on that first step of the journey to be able to have a customer to be able to allow them to interact post-sale, um, because obviously the big focus is, is, is initial sale, initial sale. Where we're moving on to now is then using booking management as a way to build CRM, as a way to build cross-sale. So yes, there's, there's very much an operational thing for them to choose a time, choose a slot, all that sort of stuff, to sort of confirm their ticket, but also it's now it's provided a space to be able to offer 
upsells, cross-sells, and value add. Yeah. And that's our real focus. Just very quickly, the other thing that has been great about Magento is the ability to create new stores quickly. So where the guys helped us, where we expand quickly. When we do a deal with a new city, it's like, oh, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Shit, we're going live in two weeks. It's, these guys have actually built the ability to be able to spin up that white label city within Magento quickly. So we're, the, we're then able to go to market in, in a couple of weeks. If we've got all the information, we can do it in a couple of weeks, which, is, which has been transformational yeah. for us. So yeah, more about getting more from the data on the APIs, and then more from the, um, the kind of template into which that the data goes, yeah. Yeah, with yeah. The, with the, the automations there. And I think that's also been key, not just in terms of spinning up cities, but one of the ways the business is, is growing is to be able to do acquisitions. That's a key kind of commercial strategy of the business. Yes. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of things we've done on the roadmap have been about not just scale because of traffic, but scale in the terms of, like say, we need to add a city. Yeah. We need to acquire an entire other operation. And yes. Um, and bring it all under that like same technical um, umbrella, same operational um, umbrella there. Um, so, so that's been pretty um, a pretty key thing for you there. Now, I think we're probably about out of time, uh, Hugo, and I'm sure everybody knows that uh, the L word, uh, lunch, is around the corner. But I just thought maybe we'd we'd pause for a minute and have a bit of a, a, a forward look, maybe give everybody a little tease as to what's on the horizon. Um, I know there's one very <laughs> drastic change we're thinking of doing, which would probably surprise most people here, mm. um, which is going to be killing the basket. I'd love to kill the basket. I've wanted to kill the basket since I joined. <laughs> um, so yeah, kill the basket. So in the concept of back in the day, the basket was where you sort of cross sell you know, do you want you know, the sweeties by the till in the supermarket? Actually, you know, as I said, the focus is let's get the core purchase done. Let's understand who that customer is through booking management. And then through the app and through booking management, build that relationship. So whether it's through value add, whether it's through engagement, competition, encouraging interaction on socials, that's really where we want to focus. And then so by definition, I mean, the basket's almost dead already, let's be honest. Um, and you haven't seen our data, but I'm telling you it is pretty much yeah. dead already. Um, so that's going. Yeah. Um, so very excited about that. Um, we haven't worked out how we're going to do it yet, but we are going to do it. Um, Absolutely. But I mean, you know, again, you know, it's led by the it's data, yeah. and it's led by yeah. a good understanding of the customer journey, of their desire to check out quickly, use express payments, yeah. and then for us to kind of look at that as a, as a challenge to then you know, unlock these projects like booking management, yeah. and then unlock the things we can do off the back of that. And it's all about customer value. You know, the basket doesn't offer anything more. There's plenty more we can offer our customers through the other stuff that we've built, so, or in the process of building. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's all good. Those other experiences. Yeah. 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 All right, then. Well, that's it for, for today. Um, can we just give a big round of applause, please, to Hugo? Thank you.